Hallelujah. God bless you. Let's just go ahead and just lift up our voices to God. Let's just, if you have your uh, heavenly language, just go ahead and just pray in the spirit right here in this moment in time. Hallelujah. God, we give you the glory, God. We give you the honor, God. We give you the adoration, God. We give you the praise. Can you guys hear me? Can you guys hear me? Can you guys hear me? God, we just bless you, God. We magnify you. We glorify you. We lift your name on high, God. We give you all of the glory, God. We give you all of the adoration, God. We give you all of the honor. God, we just magnify you, Lord God. We just bless you and adore you, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for your great and mighty power, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for everything that you've been doing thus far, Lord God. We thank you and bless you, Lord God, for you being the only true and living God. We thank you, Lord God, for you being great, for you showing yourself strong and mighty in our midst, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for you touching every person, Lord God, that's been praying, that's been going through this reset process, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for knowing, Lord God, that you are the God who answers by fire. We thank you for knowing, Lord God, that you are the strong and mighty deliverer. We thank you for knowing, Lord God, that you hear the cries of your people, Lord God, and that you stand ready and willing to answer us when we cry out to you. We thank you for knowing, Lord God, that you will never leave us, God. You'll never forsake us, Lord God, for you are a very present help in the time of trouble, Lord God. We rest in you, God. We take our refuge in you, God. We just place our hope and our confidence in you, Lord God, and we look to no other, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for you showing yourself strong as healer. We thank you, Lord God, for you showing yourself strong as the great healer that you are. We thank you, Lord God, for you healing sicknesses, for you healing infirmities, for you driving out infirmities and sicknesses that have been plaguing your people for so long, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for healing in the physical body, Lord God. We thank you for healing in the emotions, Lord God. We thank you for healing in the soul, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for you being great and mighty and you being faithful to your word, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for you being faithful, Lord God, to your word, faithful to your character. For we know, God, that you are righteous. We know, God, that you are a God of justice. We know, God, that you are a God of liberty. We know, God, that you are truth. We know, God, that you are life. We know, God, that you are love. So we rest in your promises, God. We rest in you, Lord God. We place our hope in you, God, and we honor you, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for your presence being in our lives, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for your spirit living in us, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for you dwelling in us, Lord God, for you leading us into the pathways of righteousness, God. We thank you, Lord God, for you leading us and guiding us, Lord God, into your ways, Lord God, that we will become more like you. Father, we ask God that you would forgive us of our sins, God. We ask God that you would cleanse our hearts, God. We ask God that you would cleanse our minds, God. We we ask God that you would purify us, Lord God. We ask God that you would purge us, Lord God. We ask God that you would uproot every unfruitful thing, Lord God. We ask God that you would uproot every wicked desire, Lord God. We ask God that you would uproot every evil desire, Lord God. Satan, the Lord rebuke you now. Satan, the Lord rebuke you now. We bind and rebuke demonic attacks, Lord God. We bind and rebuke demonic spirits that would seek to come in and steal, kill, and destroy. We bind and rebuke demonic uh, sp uh, demonic spirits that would come in to oppress the people of God during this time. We rebuke you now in the mighty name of Jesus. And we declare and decree that we are victorious. We declare and decree that we are victorious and that we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. God, we thank you and bless you for you establishing our identity in you. We thank you and bless you, Lord God, for you establishing our identity in righteousness, Lord God, for you establishing our identity, Lord God, in your great and mighty power. We thank you, Lord God, for you giving us authority, Lord God, to tread upon serpents, for you giving us authority to tread upon scorpions, for you giving us authority 
to cast out demons, for you giving us authority to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. So we walk in the authority that you've given us now. We walk in the identity that you've established within us now, God. We walk in the fullness of the identity, Lord God, that you have placed on the inside of us. And we thank you, Lord God, for you raising us up to a newness of life, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for you disempowering and destroying the old man. We thank you, Lord God, for the finished works of the cross, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for your precious blood that you shed on the cross, Lord God, so that we could be in relationship with you, God. We thank you for the power of the blood. We thank you for the power of the blood. We thank you for the power of the blood. We thank you for the power of the blood. We thank you for the power of the blood. For we know that the blood of Jesus has declared us righteous. We know that the blood of Jesus has declared us justified. We know that the blood of Jesus fights on our behalf. We know that the blood of Jesus has cleansed us from every form of sin that we've committed in our lives, God. We thank you for the power of the blood of Jesus. We thank you for the remission of sins. We thank you for the forgiveness of sins. We thank you, Lord God, for you drawing us near by your blood, Lord God, in the mighty name of Jesus. God, we honor you, God. We reverence you, Lord God. And we ask now, Lord God, that you would do a fresh outpouring in our midst, Lord God. We ask now, Lord God, that you would breathe upon us afresh, oh God. We ask God that you would do a fresh outpouring among us, oh God, in the mighty name of Jesus. We ask God that you would touch us, God, that you would touch us, God, that you would touch us, Lord God, with a greater measure of your spirit, with a greater measure of your power, in the mighty name of Jesus. For we desire to please you in every way, God. We desire to walk up right before you, oh God. So we ask God that you would empower us by your spirit, Lord God, that we would walk in ways that please you, Lord God. We ask God that you would empower us by your spirit, Lord God, that we would think in ways that please you, Lord God, that the meditation of our hearts, God, that the words of our mouths, Lord God, would be acceptable in your sight, God, that it would bring you glory and honor, God, that it would bring you glory and honor, Lord God. We pray now, Lord God, that you would season our words with grace, Lord God, that when we speak, Lord God, that every person that hears the words that come from my mouth, Lord God, that they would encounter your power. They would encounter your love, God, and they would encounter your spirit. And we thank you now, Lord God, for the reset that you're doing. We thank you now, Lord God, for the reset that you're doing. We thank you now, Lord God, for the reset that you're doing, Lord God. Reset us, God. Continue to reset us, Lord God. Reset us, Lord God, and set us again, Lord God, into the places that you desire us to walk in, Lord God. We thank you, God, for the reset, Lord God. We we bless you, God. We honor you, God. And we reverence you, Lord God. We give you the glory. Come on, right there. Just lift your voice to our God. Lift your voice to our God. Lift your voice to our God. Come on, bless his mighty name. Bless his mighty name. Lift up his name. Lift up his great and mighty name. Lift up his great and mighty name. We take authority now. We take authority now in the airwaves, Lord God. We take authority now and we declare and decree that no evil shall come near our dwelling. We take authority now and we declare and decree that no power of the enemy would be able to overtake us. We declare and decree that no sickness or infirmity will be able to come near our dwelling. We declare and decree that no sickness or disease would be able to overtake our families. In the mighty name of Jesus, we declare and decree that we shall walk in the purposes, God, that you've established for us. We declare and decree that we shall walk in the callings that you've laid out for us to walk in. We declare and decree that we shall fulfill the assignments that you placed on our lives. We declare and decree that we shall fulfill the mandates that you placed in our lives, Lord God. We declare and decree that we shall live and not die. We declare and decree that we shall see your goodness in the land of the living. We declare and decree that you shall satisfy us with long life. 
We declare and decree that you shall satisfy us with long life. We bind and rebuke now premature death in the mighty name of Jesus. We bind and rebuke now tragedy in the mighty name of Jesus. We bind and rebuke now premature death and tragic uh, events that would lead to premature death now in the mighty name of Jesus we ask God that you would release your angels God your angels that you have given charge to the responsibility to watch over us God we ask now that you would release angels Lord God ministering spirits to the heirs of salvation Lord God your angels that would fight for us God your angels that would watch over us God your angels that would keep us Lord God that we would not be overtaken by the forces of evil we bind and rebuke every demonic snare that the enemy has set we declare that the snares shall not prevail against us we declare and decree that the snares shall not prevail against us we declare and decree that the traps that the enemy has set we break them now in the mighty name of jesus we dismantle them now in the mighty name of jesus we bind and rebuke accusation and character assassination in the mighty name of jesus we bind and rebuke slander now in the mighty name of jesus and we declare and decree that it shall not prevail we declare and decree that it shall not prevail prevail we dismantle now the powers of witchcraft we dismantle now the powers of word curses now that have been released against us in this hour we declare and decree that every word that's been spoken against our identity that it shall not come to pass we declare and decree that every word that's been spoken against our calling we render it ineffective now in the mighty name of Jesus we declare and decree that every word curse that has been released against us your people we render it dis uh, we render it ineffective now and we disempower it now in the mighty name of Jesus we thank you for the victory God that you have given us we thank you for the victory God that you have given us and we declare and decree that we shall prevail we declare and decree that we are more than conquerors we are more than overcomers through you our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ God we bless you God we glorify you God, we honor you. God, we glorify you. As I was, as I was beginning to meditate on, on the prayer points and on a word that the Lord gave me to, to uh, declare to you all on this, on this night, one thing that the Lord began to remind me of was something very simple. The Lord began to remind me of the fact that even though all around the world we're in the midst of a, of a pandemic, we're in the midst of, of times of darkness that we have never seen uh, on the face of the earth, the Lord was beginning to remind me that he is still our provider. The Lord began to remind me that he is still the one who makes provision, even in the times and the seasons of life when it looks like there is no provision. The Lord began to remind me that he is the God of provision. He is the one who has created pathways of provision for us to walk into before this pandemic ever arrived on the scene. The Lord began to speak to me and remind me of the fact that he is bigger than this pandemic. God is bigger than this pandemic. God is bigger than the sickness that would seek to come against your body. God is bigger than the demonic attacks that would seek to come against your life, that would seek to come against your ministry. God is bigger. God is greater. And because the greater one lives on the inside of us, us. We are bigger than those things. We are greater than those things. We have an endless supply of riches in glory through Jesus Christ. We have an endless supply. We have an endless supply to the well, the well that will never run dry. So we have to live life from that place of identity and from that place of reality. We can't allow ourselves to enter into a place where we begin to become distracted by the things that we're hearing around us or distracted by the things that we're being confronted with or distracted by the opposition that comes against us. The truth of the matter is that the enemy is going to come against us. The enemy is going to afflict us. The enemy is going to try and overtake us. That's his job. That's his responsibility. That's his identity. That's who he is. He is the accuser of the brethren. But what's greater than that is the fact that greater is he who is in us than he that's in the world. So when the enemy comes against you, that's the time that we need to go back and reflect on the word of God and remind ourselves of who uh, our God is. We need to go back and reflect on the word and remind ourselves of the fact that we serve a God that never fails, that we serve a God who has never lost a battle, that we serve a God who will always reign in, uh, in triumph and victory for our God is forever triumphant and our God always causes us to triumph. So we thank God for that. 
I just dare you. I just, I just, just, just challenge you right here in this moment to just take a moment in time and just thank God for all of the times that he delivered you. Thank God for all of the times that you saw him show up on your behalf. Thank God for all of the times that, that you knew that it was only God that delivered you, that you knew it was only God that saved you. I want you to reflect back on those moments because there is great power in our ability to reflect upon the goodness of God. There's great power in our ability to reflect upon the faithfulness of God. There's great power in our ability to reflect upon the mighty character of God. So just thank God right there, just right here in this moment, just lift your hands to him and just thank him for the ways that he's shown himself strong in your life. God, we thank you for every way that you manifested your love, every way that you manifested your power, God. We thank you, Lord God, for every way that you showed up in our lives, Lord God, every way that you manifested your delivering power, God. We thank you, Lord God, and we honor you, God, and we reverence you, Lord God, and we will never forget, Lord God, who you are and who you have been to us, Lord God, for we will continue to look to you, Lord God, because you are the source of our life, you are the source of our existence, and you are the source of our provision. Without you, God, we are nothing. Without you, we are nothing. Without you, we are nothing. So this life that we live on the earth, we live it in a way that pleases you. This life that we live on the earth, we live it in a way to where you can be glorified through us. We live it in a way to where you can be honored through our bodies. In Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So the first thing that the Lord began to speak to me about was that this is the time where we need to be asking the Lord to reset us as it relates to our motives. We need to be asking God to reset us as it relates to our motives. This is very, very important because our motives have the, has the ability to dictate um, or, or serve as the, the means or the reason why we do the things that we do. If our motives are off, then we'll find ourselves doing things from a spirit that is not from, that, that is not of, uh, that doesn't come from the spirit of God. If our motives are off, we'll find ourselves doing things that are that are contrary to the word of God. If our motives are off, we'll find ourselves doing things um, in a way to where it has more self-interest involved as opposed to uh, selfless you know, service and self-sacrificial love where we're doing things to bring God glory and honor. So it's important that we make sure that everything that we're doing, that we're doing it with a pure motive before the Lord. We have to make sure that everything that we're doing, we're doing it so that God can be pleased and so that his kingdom can be advanced. This is what the book of James says. The book of James chapter three. Now I'm reading from the English standard version. James chapter 3 verses 14 through 16 it says but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts do not boast and be false to the truth this is not the wisdom that comes of now it should say that comes from God so we know right there that that particular wisdom that James is talking about is worldly wisdom that wisdom that James would go on to later reveal is a type of wisdom that is sensual and demonic. We also know that in the same way that James was identifying the selfish ambition, the same way that James was identifying the selfish motives, we know that where there is envy, we know that where there is jealousy, that there is every evil work. So that's one of the things that James would begin to identify there in the scripture was that where there's envy and where there's jealousy, there is every evil work. So if we find ourselves in a place where we have impure motives, we run the risk of entering into uh, a mode of operation or a we enter into a place where we are influenced by spirits that lead us down a pathway of envy, that lead us down a pathway of selfish ambition. And when we do this, we can expect chaos. We can expect confusion. We can expect, expect disorder. We can expect calamity. We can expect literally every evil work to be present in us and every evil work to be present around us. So we have to make sure that we are asking God to cleanse us from impure motives. Let's go through this declaration right here. I want you to repeat this. Say, I renounce every form of jealousy, envy, and selfish ambitions that would seek to operate in my life in the name of Jesus. I renounce every form of jealousy, envy, and selfish ambitions that would seek to operate in my life in the name of Jesus. 
I want you to repeat this declaration. I declare that my that the that my motives, that the motives of my heart are pure and upright before God and before men. I declare that the motives of my heart are pure and upright before God and before men. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray, Lord God, that you would touch us, Lord God, in the realm of our motives, Lord God. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord God, that you would begin to do a cleansing work on the inside of us, Lord God, a cleansing work in our motives, Lord God, that everything that we do, Lord God, that it would line up with your character, that it would line up with your will, Lord God, that it would line up with your word, Lord God, that it would be led by your spirit, Lord God. Father, I pray in Jesus' name, Lord God, that when people see us and they encounter us, Lord God, that they would encounter pure motives, pure motives that point to your righteous character, pure motives that point to your righteous character. Lord, Lord God, we thank you and bless you, Lord God, for you giving us the Holy Spirit to lead us and to guide us into all truth, to bring to our remembrance everything that you have revealed to us in your word. So we rely on the Holy Spirit to be our teacher. We rely on the Holy Spirit to illuminate our understanding, to open the eyes of our understanding, that we would be able to see and comprehend your clear and perfect will for our lives. We rely on the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would touch us, that you would touch us in the inward parts, Lord God, and that you would extract and remove every impure motive. We ask that you would do a great cleansing on the inside of us, that you would cleanse us and purify our motives in the mighty name of Jesus, in the mighty name of Jesus. The second thing that the Lord began to deal with me about was in regards to procrastination and slowfulness. Procrastination and slowfulness, these are two enemies uh, that the enemy would seek to use against us that are very powerful and that have the ability to lead us down a pathway of self-sabotage and self-destruction. So procrastination, you know, procrastination is, is basically defined as uh, the, the action of delaying or postponing something. So when we find ourselves in a place of procrastination, we continuously delay things and delay things and postpone it and postpone it. Well, what ends up happening is that we end up entering into a state of irresponsibility. And when we, pro when we procrastinate and we continue to postpone things, we now open the door and invite slowfulness to now become a part of us. We invite laziness to enter into our heart. And when that happens, our work ethic, you know, our diligence, our ability to be diligent and fruitful, all of those things now come under attack. So we know that in the very beginning in the book of Genesis that the Lord spoke to Adam and Eve and he told them to be fruitful and multiply. We also know that the enemy is totally opposed to any aspect of God's people being fruitful and multiplying. So two of the weapons that he will use to come against our ability to be fruitful, to come against our ability to multiply is procrastination and slowfulness. The enemy wants us to be in a place of stagnation. He wants us to be in a place of complacency. So procrastination, it opens the door for us to be in a place of complacency and stagnation where our movement is hindered, where our movement is, where there's restrictions in our movement in God and in the progress of the things of God. The enemy does not want you and I to move in our purpose. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 15 says this, slowfulness cast into a deep sleep and an idle person will suffer hunger. So we see there from that scripture that there is no blessing that comes from slowfulness. There is no good thing that comes from slow, slowfulness. It leads us into a deep sleep. That's a cycle and pattern of sleep. To where we sleep so much, we sleep beyond the normal, um, I think it's eight hours of sleep that we're supposed to have daily is what they say is healthy. Well, we sleep beyond that. We just find so much joy and excitement in sleeping. But as we're sleeping in these long periods of time, we're actually robbing ourselves of hours of productivity. We're robbing ourselves of moments and times where we can actually be diligent in the things of God and we can be diligent in the things that God has given us stewardship over. So the enemy doesn't want us to walk in that. And that's actually a manifestation of how the flesh can also come against us to attack us by getting us to be irresponsible. So I want you to repeat this declaration after me. I renounce the desire to be slowful in every area of my life in Jesus name. I renounce the desire to be slowful in every area of my life in Jesus mighty name.
Proverbs chapter 12, verse 24 says this, the hand of the diligent will rule while the slothful will be put to forced labor. The hand of the diligent will rule while the slothful will be put to forced labor. Now that's something that is very, very interesting to me in scripture because here we see two different realities, two different, uh, I would say, uh, realms of existence, so to speak. We have one person that is diligent and now they are operating in a place where they are empowered. They're operating in a place where they are ruling over something, where they are governing over something. So we know that Jesus, in one of his parables, he said, uh, uh, he was talking to um, one of, I can't remember exactly what parable it was, but he said, because you were faithful over the few things, I will make you ruler over many. So we see faithfulness and diligence are directly tied together. So in order for us to be faithful in the things of God, in order for us to be faithful with the things that God has entrusted us with, we have to be diligent. But slowfulness and procrastination wages war against our ability to be diligent. We know that the Bible declares that God is the rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So we know that diligence is, is very, very important in the life of a believer. Diligence is very, very important in our lives because it opens the door for God to reward us. It opens the door for God to bless us. It opens the door for God to increase our capacity. It opens the door for God to enlarge our territory. Sometimes we find ourselves in places where we're praying and we're asking God to enlarge our territory, but in actuality, we're not ready to step into that reality. We're not ready to step into that place of existence because on the inside of us, we still have areas of slowfulness and procrastination that's operating on the inside of us. So we can't expect God to bless us with more or with a larger territory or with a greater measure of increase where he's given us a greater responsibility to steward over things if we are walking in procrastination and slowfulness god is not going to do that for us because it will bring discredit and dishonor to his name and it's something that could actually be harmful to us so it's important that we make sure that we don't live life from that place of procrastination and slowfulness I want you to decree this after me. I declare that I am not a procrastinator, but I am diligent in all things in Jesus' name. I declare that I am not a procrastinator, but that I am diligent in all things in Jesus' name. Proverbs chapter 13 verse, verse 4 says this, The soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing while the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. Again, we see here in the scripture that the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. But on the contrary, the soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing. The soul of the sluggard, that person that's lazy, that person that doesn't have any type of drive, any type of you know willpower to just go get things done, they always crave. They talk about all these things that they want in life, but the 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 the, the things that they're saying, it does not produce the reality of those things in their lives because their actions and their words are not one and the same. They have these desires. You know, how many times have we found ourselves in places where we said that we want things? We said that we, you know, we had these longings and these cravings for things, but in actuality, we didn't truly, we didn't truly want it in our hearts. How do I say this? Because our actions didn't reflect that we really wanted it. Our actions didn't reflect that we were mature enough to walk in it. Our actions didn't reflect that we were mature enough to enter into uh, the, the level of you know accessibility to those things. So we have to make sure again that our hearts are prepared to walk in a place of diligence so that we can be richly supplied with the things that God desires and intends for us to have in our lives. Amen. Let's declare this. I declare that I am not slowful in my affairs, but I am diligent in all things in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you now for the power that you have given us to be diligent in all things. We thank you now for the power that you have given us over slowfulness, over procrastination. And we declare and decree that the power of procrastination is broken off of our lives now in the name of Jesus. We declare and decree that the power of laziness is broken off of our lives in the name of Jesus. We declare and decree that the power of slowfulness is broken off of our lives in the name of Jesus. We declare and decree that we will be diligent. We declare and decree 
that we will be fruitful and that we will multiply. We declare and decree that we will be diligent in all of our affairs, that we will be responsible and faithful stewards over everything that you have charged us with the responsibility to steward in Jesus mighty name. Amen. The next thing that God began to deal with me about was soul winning. So the Lord began to speak to me about the importance of us having the right desire to win souls in this hour. So as I was thinking about reset, the Lord literally revealed this to me in this context, that we need a reset on the inside of us, in our hearts and in our minds, as it relates to our desire to win souls. We need a reset in our hearts and in our minds as it relates to our desire to win souls. Winning souls is something that is greatly important to God. How do we know this? Because we know that it was because of the great and mighty love of God that God sent Jesus Christ into the earth, that God was in Christ reconciling humanity to himself. Why? Because of his great love. God always wanted to and wants to be in relationship with every human being. We know that the Bible declares that it's God's will that no man should perish, but that all men should come to repentance, that all men should come into a place of eternal life in Jesus Christ. But we also know that there is going to come a time where some people are going to reject the invitation. They're going to to reject the love gift of Jesus Christ that was given to serve as a means to reconcile them into their rightful place in Jesus Christ. But we as believers have the responsibility to be ambassadors. We've been given the ministry of reconciliation and we've been given the word of reconciliation. We've been charged with the responsibility to proclaim the gospel to the lost. We've been charged with the responsibility to go out and make disciples of all men, of all nations, of all ethnicities. We've been charged with that responsibility. But one thing that I've noticed, you know, is that it seems like there are a lot of people that are not interested in winning souls. It seems like in the time that we're living in, that there is a disinterest as it relates to getting out in the streets and winning souls. So I declare and decree now, that no longer shall we walk in a place where we are complacent and comfortable with not winning souls. No longer shall we walk in a place where we are comfortable with not evangelizing. No longer shall we walk in a place where we are comfortable with just going to church and going home, going to church and only being concerned about our family, only being concerned about our household, only being concerned about our friends, only being concerned about ourselves. God, deliver us from every form of selfish Christianity, God. Deliver us, God, from every form of self-centered Christianity, Lord God, that we would be able to walk upright before you and advance your kingdom in the earth. Deliver us, God, from selfishness, Lord God, that we will be able to proclaim your gospel, Lord God, with love, righteousness, power, demonstration, and integrity in the name of Jesus. Proverbs 11 and 30 says this, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and whoever captures souls is wise. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and whoever captures souls is wise. Let's, de let's decree this and declare this. I declare that I possess the wisdom to win souls for Christ. I declare that I possess the wisdom to win souls for Christ in Jesus mighty name. The next thing that the Lord began to deal with me about was resetting our desires to be students of the word of God. We have to make sure that we never lose our desire to study the word of God. We have to make sure that we never lose our desire to immerse ourselves in the word of God. We have to make sure that we never lose our desire as it relates to our, our hunger and thirst for God's word. God's word is powerful. God's word reveals God's mind to us. God's word teaches us how to live. God's word trains us in righteousness. God's word equips us. God's word enables us to be able to see a, a vast multitude of examples and encounters of how God began to show himself as righteous, as judge, you know, as merciful, as loving. You know, the word of God, it reveals the character of God. It reveals a consistent track record of God's faithfulness to his people. So we have to be in a place where we have a earnest desire to study the word of God. 
Second Timothy chapter three and verse 16 says this. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and for training in righteousness. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and for training in righteousness. The scripture reveals that the word of God, it, it comes directly from the mouth of God. The word of God comes directly from the breath of God. The word of God contains the life of God. It contains the essence of God. It contains the character of God. It contains the power of God. This is why if we take the word of God and we need healing in our bodies and we declare that we are healed according to the word of God, healing will occur in our lives. Why? Because the word of God is living. The word of God is a tangible manifestation of the breath of God, the life of God, the power of God, the character of God, and the nature of God. So we cannot lose sight of the importance of studying the word of God. Second Timothy 3 and 17 says this, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. It is God's will that we are complete and equipped for every good work. It is God's will that we are made complete and made whole and that we are able to accomplish every good work in him. Every good work that reflects his character, every good work that is rooted in his character. It's God's will for us to walk in the good works that he has predestined for us to walk in. But we won't be able to do this if we do not value and cherish the word of God. Let's make this declaration. I declare that I will value the word of God and its power to teach me, to train me, to reprove me and correct me according to the knowledge and righteousness of God. I declare that I will value the word of God and its power to teach me, train me, reprove me and correct me according to the knowledge and righteousness of God. Psalms chapter 119 verse 105 says this, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Father God, we thank you, Lord God, for your word being a lamp to our feet. We thank you, Lord God, for your word being a light to our path. We thank you, Lord God, for your word leading us, for your word guiding us, Lord God, for your word illuminating clear pathways of righteousness for us to follow, for us to embark upon, and for us to walk in. We thank you for the great power that's in your word to transform us, to equip us for every good work in you. In Jesus' mighty name. Psalm chapter 119 verse 11 says this. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. It is important that we treasure the word of God in our hearts because when we treasure the word of God in our hearts, it leads us into a place where we are empowered not to sin against God. When we treasure the word of God in our hearts, the Holy Spirit then brings to our remembrance that word that we've stored up in our hearts during the hours of temptation, during the hours of trials and testing, the Holy Spirit brings that word to our remembrance. And once he brings it to our remembrance, we are charged with the responsibility and the, the, the ability to make a choice to either decide to submit to the word of God or to decide to submit to our flesh. We have to treasure and value the word of God. The word of God has the power to preserve our lives. The word of God has the power to keep us. The word of God has the power to govern our minds. The word of God has the power to protect and preserve and strengthen us in every area of our lives and every area of our physical bodies. We must cherish and value the word of God. The next point that the Lord began to, to lead me to address here was, deliverance from the fear of rejection deliverance from the fear of rejection i know in my personal life i encountered a, a various um various forms of rejection throughout my lifetime i encountered rejection from the time before i was born throughout my childhood throughout my adulthood and one thing that ended up happening in my life as a result of encountering those various forms and seasons of rejection was that i began to develop a fear of rejection the truth of the matter is that rejection does not feel good. And anything that does not feel good, if we find ourselves in a place where naturally we can become fearful of that experience of pain, 
we can become fearful of experiencing that painful thing. So anytime that we are fearful of experiencing something that's painful, we can find ourselves acting outside of the character of God. We can find ourselves doing things in a way to where we think that we're avoiding rejection, but we're actually entering into a place that's outside of God's will for our lives. So we have to make sure that our lives are not governed by the fear of rejection. We have to make sure that our lives are not governed by the fear of rejection. When man rejects you and I, God has already accepted us. We are accepted into the great and mighty love of God. We are accepted in the great and mighty love of Jesus Christ. We are accepted and we are engrafted into the body of Jesus Christ. So we are accepted by God through the spirit of adoption. God has accepted you. God accepts you. God loves you. God loves you with an unfailing love. So there's no reason for you and I to live life from a place where we are now walking in the fear of rejection. Psalm chapter uh, 136 verse 26 says this. Give thanks to the God of heaven for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven for his steadfast love endures forever. Let's just pause right there and thank God. God, we thank you for your steadfast love. We thank you for your steadfast love that endures forever, God. We thank you, Lord God, for all of the times that you have shown yourself faithful to love us, Lord God, even when men turned their backs on us, God, even when we didn't believe in ourselves, God, even when we wanted to take our lives and commit suicide and throw in the towels, God. We thank you, Lord God, for your love being released upon us. We thank you for your love resting upon us. Now, I hear this very, very clearly. For, for whoever the person is that's been contemplating suicide, the Lord is speaking to you now in this moment in time. And he is saying that I love you with an unfailing love. I love you with an unfailing love. My love endures forever. And my love is so great and mighty that my love has the power to redeem you from the, the, the desire that, or the thoughts that you have been confronted with to take your own life. God says it is not my will that you take your life. But it is my will that you enter into a place of eternal life with me. It's my will that you enter into a place of love and fellowship. Trust in me, says the Lord, and I will deliver you from the fear of rejection. Trust in me and I will deliver you from the power of rejection. We bind and rebuke now the spirit of suicide now in the mighty name of Jesus. We bind and rebuke suicidal thoughts, suicidal ideations now in the name of Jesus. We dismantle the voice of the enemy. We bind and rebuke demonic voices that would try to speak into their lives to influence them to go down pathways of self-sabotage and suicide in the name of Jesus. And we loose now the love of Christ to permeate their hearts. We loose now the love of Christ to permeate their minds. Holy Spirit, we ask God that you would touch them, God. Touch every person that has contemplated suicide in the name of Jesus. Touch them, heal them, and deliver them now in the mighty name of Jesus. Let's make this declaration. Say, Lord, I receive your steadfast love and your steadfast love has freed me from the fear of rejection in Jesus name. Say, Lord, I receive your steadfast love and your steadfast love has freed me from the fear of rejection in Jesus name. Next, we have the spirit of fear. Deliver us, God, from the spirit of fear. Deliver us from the spirit of fear. Many of you may have dealt with the spirit of fear at some point in time in your life. Some of you may be dealing with it now. But one thing that I've come to declare and decree now is that you have no reason to fear. For God is with you. You have no reason to fear. For Christ, the indwelling Christ, is living on the inside of you. You have no reason to fear because the Holy Spirit is living on the inside of you. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, you have authority over fear. By the power of the Holy Spirit, you have authority over the powers of darkness that would seek to operate through fear, that would seek to steal, kill, and destroy your life through fear. You have power and authority by the power of the Holy Spirit. You have no reason to fear. 2 Timothy 1 and 7 says this, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, 
but of power, love, and self-control. Some translations say a sound mind. For God did not give us the spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. Fear comes against us in a way to disempower us or to prevent us from walking in the power and the authority that we have in the Holy Spirit. Fear tries to come against us to deprive us of our rights to, to abide in the love of God. Fear tries to come against us to attack our identity in the love of God. Fear tries to come against us to attack our ability to walk in the sound mind that we have been given through the Holy Spirit. Fear comes against us to attack our mind, to get us to go into a place of doubt, to get us to go into a place of unbelief, to get us to go into a place of fear and worry and anxiety. Fear comes against us, but the Bible declares that we have not been given the spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. I declare and decree now that no longer shall you walk in fear. No longer shall you walk in timidity. No longer shall your life be dominated by the spirit of fear. But you shall walk in the power of God. You shall walk in the authority of God. You shall walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. You shall walk in the sound mind that God has given you. You shall walk in the identity of being uh, rooted and grounded in the love of Christ. You shall walk in self-control in the name of Jesus. Let's make this declaration. I renounce every covenant that I have made with the spirit of fear in the name of Jesus. I renounce every covenant that I have made with the spirit of fear in the name of Jesus. Every time that we will find ourselves in a place where we come into agreement with the words, the utterance that the spirit of fear is launching against us, at that point in time that we've come into agreement, we have just entered into covenant with the spirit of fear. So when we enter into covenant with the spirit of fear, we have now given the spirit of fear legal right to access our hearts. We've given the spirit of fear legal right to access our minds and to access our mouths and to access our ability to hear and to see things clearly and ultimately govern the direction that our life goes in. We have now given the spirit of fear access, legal right to come in and to now attack our motives and our desires and, and speak to us in a way to where false perceptions regarding ourselves and those around us and including God are now created and they consistently play before us. We have to make sure that we are walking in the authority of the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. We break now and dismantle every covenant that's associated with the spirit of fear now in the name of Jesus. Let's declare this. I declare that I have no reason to fear because I am secured by the perfect love of God. I declare that I have no reason to fear because I am secured by the perfect love of God. Just take a moment and thank God for securing you with his perfect love. God, we thank you for securing us with your perfect love in Jesus' mighty name. The next thing that the Lord began to deal with me about was supernatural provision. Supernatural provision shall be your portion. Just decree that over yourself. Say supernatural provision shall be my portion. It doesn't matter how dark things may look. Supernatural provision shall be my portion. Philippians 4.19 says this. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. In Jesus Christ, there is an endless supply of riches. There is no lack in Jesus Christ. There is no poverty in Jesus Christ. There is no barrenness in Jesus Christ. The only thing that is in Jesus Christ is life. For Jesus Christ himself declared that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So we know that Jesus is life. So if Jesus is life and we are lacking things in our personal life, then all we have to do is call upon him. All we have to do is cry out to him. All we have to do is access that supernatural preserve, that supernatural reservoir that God has given us through our relationship with Jesus Christ. And God will supply all of our needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Let's declare this. I declare that all of my needs are supplied by the glorious riches of Christ. 
I declare that all of my needs are supplied by the glorious riches of Christ. Hallelujah. Number eight, let's declare this. I walk in the fear of the Lord. I walk in the fear of the Lord. We are living in a time where it seems like there are many people that are not walking in the reverential fear of God. Anytime that the fear of God is lacking in a society, in a church, in a person's life, in a generation of people, some of the things that you can see is discord, strife, calamity, wickedness, lawlessness, anarchy, disorder, dishonor. All of these things are present because there is no fear of the Lord present among those people or on the inside of those persons. Proverbs chapter one, verse seven says this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs chapter 8 verse 13 says this, the fear of the Lord is hatred of evil, pride and arrogance, and the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. The fear of the Lord produces a hate for evil. The fear of the Lord produces a hatred for wickedness. The fear of the Lord produces a hatred, a hatred for things that God hates, a hatred for things that 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 cause God to cringe, that cause the Holy Spirit to be grieved. The fear of the Lord is to hate every form of evil. We can't say that we fear the Lord, but we are in love with evil things. We can't say that we fear the Lord, but we are captivated by demonic systems, demonic principles, and demonic things. We can't say that we fear the Lord, but we're in an illegal love affair with our flesh. We have to make sure that the confession that comes from our mouth matches our heart and ultimately is seen and manifested in our actions. Let's make this declaration. I declare that I walk in the fear of the Lord and I hate all forms of evil in Jesus name. I declare that I walk in the fear of the Lord and I hate all forms of evil in Jesus name. Let's make this declaration. I declare that I am free from the fear of man. I declare that I am free from the fear of man. The fear of man is another tool that the enemy would seek to use primarily in the way of intimidation, control, bondage, and oppression. The enemy tries to release attacks as it relates to the fear of man to keep us in a place where we never live out our full potential in God. The enemy will try to use the fear of man to bring us in a place to where we willfully forfeit our ability to walk in the power of God, which is we have a spirit that is of power, love, and a sound mind. So the spirit of God that's inside of us, the character of God that's on the inside of us is far greater than the spirit of fear and the fear of man. Proverbs chapter 29 says this. Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 25 says this. The fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. So the fear of man, it creates a trap. It creates a snare that leads us into a place of captivity. The fear of man leads us into a place of bondage and it leads us into a place where we are no longer walking in the will of God and we are no longer walking in the place of freedom. See the, the word there snare, that's a trap. It is something that, that, that is used to ensnare us, to stop our movement and to ultimately hold us in a place of captivity, a place of bondage so that the enemy who we know walks about like a roaring lion see and seeks whom he may devour. When we are caught in that snare, the enemy comes because now he has the opportunity to devour us. So we have to make sure that we are not walking according to the fear of man, but that we're walking according to the fear of the Lord and that we are trusting the Lord. The Bible says, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. There is safety when we trust in the Lord. In the book of Acts chapter five, verse 29, it says this, but Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than man. Now, Peter and the apostles in this scripture, in the scripture, in the preceding verses, they were literally um, in a place where they were being told that they could not preach in the name of Jesus because as they would preach in the name of Jesus, as God would use them in that particular region, literally the world was being turned upside down. Literally economic systems were being dismantled. You know, uh, uh, um, 
philosophical systems were being turned upside down, you know, and, and the, that entire culture of that day was being transformed into the image of Christ. So now we had a bunch of, you know, there was a bunch of um, religious leaders that were coming against them and telling them, you cannot preach in the name of Jesus in this region. But you know what Peter and the apostles said to them? They said, we must obey God rather than man. So Peter and the apostles had enough wisdom. They had enough commitment to their faith in Jesus Christ to literally look the look into the eyes of legal authorities, look into the eyes of people that had power, and they had enough of, uh, power on the inside of them to speak directly to them and tell them that we must obey God rather than obey man. Although you have power, although you have authority, your power power is not greater than my God. Although you have power, although you have authority in the earth, your power is not greater than the power of Jesus Christ. Although you have the ability to put people in jail, you don't have the ability to put me in heaven or in hell. So I have to make sure that I am obeying God before I submit myself to your rules and your dictates. Because at this point, you're revealing that your rules, your dictates, and your desires are antichrist in nature. So because of this reason, I am making the commitment to obey God rather than obey man. Let's make this declaration. I declare that my life is no longer governed by the fear of man. I declare that my life is no longer governed by the fear of man. I declare that I will obey God rather than obey man in Jesus' name. In every area of your life where you are being challenged with the decision to obey God or to obey man, make that declaration and stand on that declaration. I declare that I will obey God rather than obey man in Jesus' mighty name. Freedom from the root of bitterness and unforgiveness. Freedom from the root of bitterness and unforgiveness. God wants us to be free from the root of bitterness and unforgiveness. In the book of Hebrews chapter 12 verse 15 it says this. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. That no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble. And by it many become defiled. The root of bitterness has the ability to produce trouble, defilement, and it has the ability to deprive us from the grace that God has given us, from the grace that God wants to continuously give us and deposit into our lives on a daily basis. The root of bitterness is toxic. The root of bitterness is something that has the ability to lead us into a place of captivity. The root of bitterness is something that has the ability to deprive us of the blessings of the life that God wants us to have. The root of bitterness has the power to even open the door for sickness to plague our body. The root of bitterness has the power to open the door for disease and infirmity to plague our body. The root of bitterness has the ability to open the door for other things to enter in such as, uh, such as unforgiveness and unbelief. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 32 says this, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. So we see that it is the will of God that we be kind, that we be tenderhearted towards one another and that we are forgiving. Why? Because God forgave us. God, we thank you, Lord God, for the power and the victory that you have given us over the root of bitterness. We declare and decree now that no longer shall we live life from a place of unforgiveness, from the root of bitterness. We uproot it now in the mighty name of Jesus. And we make the choice by the power of your Holy Spirit, by the confession of our faith, to live a life of freedom where we continuously and consistently forgive. We dismantle and we renounce every covenant agreement that we have made with unforgiveness and with the root of bitterness in Jesus mighty name. Amen. God reset us from the place of captivity and lead us into the place of victory. What do I mean by that? The way the Lord revealed this to me was that God desires to lead us from every place of captivity in our lives and establish us in places of victory over those areas where we were once bound and captive to. 
The reality is that in every person's life, there are things in our flesh that tries to dominate our lives. But in the life of the believer, we sin by choice, not because we don't have the power to overcome sin. This is why we have to renew our minds with the word of God. When we renew our minds with the word of God, we come into a greater reality of who we are in Christ. And now through the knowledge of the word of God, we are empowered to walk and live life from our identity, from that renewed mindset. And now we see the transformative power, the transformational power of Jesus Christ being released into our lives where we are now able to exercise authority over places of bondage and captivity in Jesus name. The scripture that the Lord gave me, uh, it was in uh, the book of Exodus, uh, chapter 14, verse number 13. Very familiar scripture. And this is what it says. Do not, or it says, and Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more. The Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more. Let's make this declaration. I declare that I am free from every form of demonic captivity, and I declare that I am walking in absolute victory through Jesus Christ. I declare that I am free from every form of demonic captivity, and I declare that I am walking in absolute victory through Jesus Christ. And lastly, we need to declare, I am free from pride and empowered to walk in humility. I am free from pride and empowered to walk in humility. It is important that we make sure that we are freed from pride. Pride is the thing that will come against us to kill us. Pride is the thing that, that led Satan to a place to where he there was no longer room, there was no longer space for him to exist in heaven. And he was ultimately cast out because pride was in his heart. And the other thing that happened as a result of pride in the life of Lucifer was that there was a change in his identity. He, he, he lost his heavenly nature. He lost the nature that God had created on the inside of him. And he entered into a fallen nature. He entered into a fallen state because of pride and pride was iniquity that was found in his heart proverbs 11 and 2 says this when pride comes then comes disgrace but with the humble is wisdom when pride comes then comes disgrace but with the humble is wisdom just lift your hands right there and let's just pray as we close out father in jesus name i pray for every person that's viewing this broadcast Father, I pray, Lord God, that you would deliver us from every form of pride in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray that you would deliver us from the captivity of pride in the name of Jesus. I pray that you would deliver us from the bondage of pride. Deliver us in our thinking. Deliver us from prideful thoughts. Deliver us from prideful attitudes. Deliver us from prideful motives. Deliver us from prideful actions in the mighty name of Jesus. And help us, Lord God. Empower us, Lord God, to walk in humility. For you've declared in your word that you resist the proud but you give grace to the humble so god we humble ourselves in your sight and we receive the grace that you desire to pour out in us we humble ourselves in your sight and we receive the grace that you desire to pour out in us we renounce every form of pride in the name of jesus we renounce every covenant agreement that we've made with pride in the name of jesus and we make the commitment on this day to walk in the humility, the humility that you place on the inside of us. Because we know, God, that you give grace to the humble and that humility pleases you. It is in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray. God bless you. Be blessed. And remember, reset. Your life has been changed forever. God bless you.